Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. Welcome to Let the Bible Speak. About six months ago, we explored the meaning, the purpose, and modern relevance of the giving of the ninth commandment in Exodus 20, verse 16, which reads, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Looking again at this command as a beautiful diamond, we will explore more facets of this great truth, how it should impact our lives and convict the world. Let us keep in mind as we address this command that the Holy Spirit warned similarly in Proverbs 6, verse 16 through 19, that the Lord hates a lying tongue, that the Lord hates a false witness who speaks lies. Jesus said the devil is a liar and the father of lies in John 8, 44. The same apostle says, in contrast, in the same gospel, I am the truth, John 14, 6, and the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, John 16, 13. Of course, we understand that the root of lying is deception. He who lies intends to deceive the one to whom he is speaking. Satan, the master deceiver, pulled this ploy out of his bag of tricks to rob Adam and Eve, and in turn, the human race of the beauty and bliss of the once sinless, sickless, sorrowless garden. Whenever we associate lying with the devil, it repulses us. And could we keep that connection fresh in our mind, we might be able to avoid this sin. I mean, who wants to be like the devil? Unfortunately, we are bombarded with lying by all kinds of people, with the powerful, influential men and women, to the point that we become desensitized to this great evil. In fact, some, sad to say, even attach a degre degree of respectability to lying. The cover of the October 5th, 1992 issue of Time Magazine was lying. Everybody's doing it. In a report from January 2010, where a national survey asked 1,000 United States adults to report the number of lies told in a 24-hour period, 40% of the respondents had lied in the previous 24 hours. Deception is not just an American phenomenon. Os Guinness relays the story of how Nikita Khrushchev, the former Soviet leader, once told that an epidemic of thievery in the former Soviet Union became so bad that guards were placed at all factory gates. At a plant in Leningrad, a, a man named Petrovich came out with a wheelbarrow carrying a huge, suspicious-looking sack. What have you got there, Petrovich? asked the guard. Just sawdust and shavings, Petrovich replied. Come on, responded the guard. I wasn't born yesterday. Dump it out. To his surprise, there was only sawdust and shavings. Petrovich put it all back in the sack and went home. The same scene was repeated every night for a week. Finally, overcome with curiosity, the frustrated guard said, Petrovich, I know you. Tell me what you're smuggling out of here and I'll let you go. Petrovich said, wheelbarrows. You shall not bear false witness after our song.
The Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to issue repeated warnings against lying. We read, for example, in Ephesians 4, 25, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So if God is so clearly wrong when we deceive, when we break our word, and we know it, why lie? People lie for a host of reasons. Wayne Hastings provides a list of some of the kinds of lies that we tell in his book, If You Take My Hand, My Son. There are a number of different kinds of lies. There's the cruel lie. This kind of lie is motivated by jealousy, revenge, hurt, anger, hate, and resentment in order to inflict pain on others. The cowardly lie, this kind of lie you tell to escape consequences. This lie is motivated by fear. There's the conceited lie. This bragging and boasting lie is the attempt of an insecure individual to impress others. This actually has the opposite effect, bringing the hearer to either be annoyed or to pity the liar. Then there's the calculated lie that is designed to manipulate other people to get our way. The convenient lie is told to avoid any kind of uncomfortable situation. People tell this kind of lie when they desire to avoid offending anybody. The desire to avoid offending anyone outweighs their commitment to telling the truth. Flattery. Flattery is lying to lift others up. Flattery is like soft soap, 90% lie. Avoid it. You've heard cultural flattery as well. Someone comes to work and they have a, let's say, hideous haircut. Everyone says to their face, oh, how good it looks. We love it. But when they leave, they roll their eyes at each other because it's an obvious disaster. Then there's the salesperson who may stroke the potential buyer with words that he may not even mean. Neither of these honor the Christ, who is the truth, and there's religious flattery. How often have people ascribed to religious leaders titles that belong only to God? Jesus says plainly in Matthew 23, 9, do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Others refer to mere men as reverend when the Bible speaks only of God in such exalted language. Psalm 111, 9, holy and reverend is his name, God's name. Some who would not go to these extremes flatter false teachers with their moral and financial support. They commend their teaching when it contradicts God's Word. Listen, that's not acceptable. The Bible says in 2 John 9 through 11, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine, the teaching of Christ, does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, the truth, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Albert Barnes writes on 2 John verses 10, the phrase, receive him not into your house. This cannot mean that no acts of kindness in any circumstances were to be shown to such persons, but that there was to be nothing done which could be fairly construed as encouraging or countenancing them as religious teachers. We are not to attend on their instruction. We are not to receive them into our houses or to entertain them as religious teachers. We are not to commend them to others or to give them any reason to use our names or influence in propagating error. Then on the phrase, neither bid him Godspeed, he writes, the word used expresses the common form of salutation as when we wish one health, success, prosperity. It would be understood as expressing a wish for success in the enterprise in which they were embarked. And though we should love all men and desire their welfare and sincerely seek their happiness, yet we can properly wish no one success in a career of sin and error. 
Isn't it true that false teachers bear false witness against God's Word? So many people are not even paying attention to what's being said and comparing it to the Scripture. Paul speaks in Romans 1.25 of those who exchange the truth of God for a lie. You know, it's hard to imagine a more heinous sin, a more egregious affront against a holy God than to corrupt, pervert, and misrepresent what the New Testament teaches about salvation, worship, and moral living. Ten years ago, the Episcopalian Church affirmed openly homosexual Gene Robinson as bishop. Nine years ago, a United Church of Christ TV ad openly endorsed homosexuality. Please do not confuse the United Church of Christ with the churches of Christ that present Let the Bible Speak. And now, a Bible, and I use the term in the loosest way possible, has been released called the Queen James Bible that adds and subtracts from the Word of God to present homosexuality in a favorable light. In so doing, the publishers bear false witness against the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. A house of worship should be the last place you would hear a lie. But that is not the case. God legislated the death penalty for those who told religious lies. In Deuteronomy 13, verse 1 through 10, that shows us how serious it was. These false teachers used sensationalism to give respectability to their lies. People came for the show. The drawing power was not simple truth, but spiced up lies. Beware of individuals who promote showtime religion instead of old-time religion. Showtime religion, remember, appeals to the flesh. Old-time religion appeals to the spirit. Religious people have been exchanging the truth for a lie in salvation, worship, and other areas, peddling lies under the guise of fun and frivolity, entertainment and social amusements, recreation and rock and roll. Whatever happened to acknowledging and resting in the power of the gospel? Why can't we say today with the Apostle Paul in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Man has muzzled the moral message of the Ten Commandments because he rejects the righteousness of God. Jesus commended the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2, 2 for testing those who say they are apostles and are not and finding them liars. We must do the same. Another deceptive ruse disseminated by the devil's henchmen is might makes right. Have you ever heard someone say, well, look at how many people believe that way, practice that way. That many people can't be wrong. The assumption, of course, is that the majority is right. If there is anything we should have learned throughout history, it is that the majority is often wrong. After spying out the land, Joshua and Caleb confirmed God's victory, but the majority of spies cowardly predicted defeat. The people listened to the majority instead of the minority that spoke for God. As a result, God's people wandered in the wilderness 40 years before leaving before dying there, rather, leaving Joshua and Caleb as the only adults who began the journey being able to be able to enter in to the promised land. Some appear to believe if a majority believes something, then that makes it true. Not so. As Moses put it in Exodus 23, 2, thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Or as Paul wrote in Romans 4, 3, let God be true and let every man be a liar. Gandhi understood a principle that many professing Christians seem to have missed. Gandhi said, an error does not become truth by reason of multiplied propagation, nor does truth become error because nobody sees it. Another deceptive stunt you need to be able to recognize starts with, well, that's just your interpretation. Listen to what they do with Mark 16, 16, with this interpretation business. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Oh, well, that's just your interpretation. They interpret it to say, He that believes and is not baptized shall be saved. This kind of interpretation is corruption and perversion of the scriptural text. The question this morning is, how committed are you to the truth of God's Word? How tolerant are you of others 
bearing false witness against the Word of God. Does it matter to you? Can you agree with Martin Luther's philosophy? Peace, if possible. Truth at all costs. Jesus prayed that we be united in John 17, verse 20 through 23, but not at the expense of the truth that he demanded three verses earlier in John 17, 17. Another man put it well, it is better to be divided by truth than to be united in error. Lying often leads to more lies, doesn't it? One beautiful spring morning, four high school boys decided to ditch their Monday morning classes. On their way back to school, they agreed that they would blame their tardiness on a flat tire and the problems that they encountered in getting it fixed. They synchronized their stories. The four of them walked into their afternoon class together and one of the young men told about the flat tire, the trouble with the spare, and how long it took to get help. Okay, the teacher said, sit down. Each of you take out a sheet of paper and a pencil. Now each of you write down the answer to this question. Which tire went flat? Lying can lead to trouble, but so can heeding a lie. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 and 4, the apostle warned, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. He was talking about people who didn't want God's Word as is. Are your spiritual ears itching for something different than what can be found right here? Someone once said, when a man who is honestly mistaken hears the truth, he will either quit being mistaken or cease to be honest. How are you responding to the truth. Do you really love the truth? Don't think you can blindly follow your favorite religious instructor and escape unscathed only to blame him on the judgment day. Oh no. Listen to Jesus in Matthew 5, 15, verse 12 through 14. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Fascinating story is told in 1 Kings chapter 13 that illustrates the peril of allowing the subjective testimony of man to trump the objective testimony of the Word of God. After pronouncing a curse on the altar in Bethel, as God commanded, and after restoring the withering hand of King Jeroboam who tried to restrain him, the prophet of God refused the king's offer of hospitality, saying, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. The prophet initially responded appropriately, to the temptation to disobey God. But men who witnessed the confrontation brought word back to their father. Their father, an old prophet, insisted they chase after the man of God. When they caught up to him, the old man invited him home to eat. The man of God refused, again reciting the Lord's warning. Then the old prophet said in verse 18, 1 Kings 13, verse 18, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. Yeah, he was a prophet. Yeah, he talked about angels telling him, but it was a lie. And the young prophet heeded the lie of the old prophet because the older man called himself a prophet. As a result of his disobedience, the younger prophet was slain by a lion on his way home. What do we learn from this tragic story? We learn there is a penalty for listening to a lie just as there is for telling a lie. Specifically in this story, we see how to handle conflicting voices that speak regarding the will of the Lord. We must always take the objective written word of the Lord, never changing the scriptures over the subjective sermon, vision, 
dream, etc., offered by one claiming to be a messenger of the Lord. Jesus warned in Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. If in your spiritual journey you go bebopping along, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, clinging to the last words you heard as the truth, you'll be headed for disaster spiritually, just like that young prophet. When we hear conflicting voices, we must always test the subjective claims of man with the objective truth found in the pages of inspiration. The Apostle John cautioned in 1 John 4, 1, Brethren, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Do not be awed by a man's intelligence, his education, his charisma, or following. Do not be unduly influenced by sensational claims of dreams, visions, miracles, or other experiences. Cling instead to the Scriptures, the written Word. For as Jesus says in John 12, 48, He who does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. The Holy Spirit says plainly in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the final pages of inspiration, Revelation 20, verse 12, the Holy Spirit confirms this warning. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. We're going to stand before God one day and be judged by the Word of God, not by the words, ideas, and think-sos, opinions of man. Let's make sure we're living by the truth of the book and avoid all evil and falsehood. Stay with us, and we'll tell you how you can get a copy of this message after our song. Sunday. We have time to read one more passage that warns us of the danger of listening to a lie. 2 Thessalonians 2, beginning with verse 10, And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. 
And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You have the choice. You have to make the decision. If you've been worshiping someplace where you've been hearing error and false doctrine, where the religious practices you know do not fit with what the Scriptures teach, whether it's worship or salvation or morals, it's time you took a stand. We're challenging you this morning to say no to error, to say no to falsehood, and to turn to the Lord to serve Him, to worship Him in spirit and in truth. I wonder if there's someone in our audience today who has not obeyed the gospel. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 9, the Bible says that Jesus is coming back with His holy angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Yes, you must believe, but you also must obey the gospel. You must be baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, 38. Won't you contact us so we can help you? Thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak. We pray you have heard God speak to you through His Word. If you'd like a copy of this sermon, False Witness, Part 2, number 905, please write or call us. You may also request a free Bible study course to complete at home. Visit LetTheBibleSpeak.com to watch videos, hear podcasts, and read transcripts of the program at your convenience. Join the Let the Bible Speak Facebook page for weekly updates on the program airing in your market and to tell friends or family about the program airing in their part of the country. On behalf of the congregations listed shortly, we echo the sentiment of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week. For